Hey everyone, welcome yet again to another episode of Elevate Out Strategy Leadership Live Fireside Chat. This is episode two of season two. Really glad that you could join us today again. Um, we have a very special guest yet again today, but uh, this particular gentleman is is particularly near and dear to my career heart because I began my career at this place of which he is CEO. So, uh, but first of all, I wanted to remind you of this this series uh, at Fireside Chat is really intended to be one of storytelling. And uh, the reason why uh, I set this up about a year ago was because on LinkedIn, I realized there's a lot of, uh, especially from us coaches, a lot of you know the how-tos about LinkedIn, um, how to set up your resume, how to prepare for interviews, but there really wasn't a forum for leaders to share their personal journeys. And uh, as I was coaching executives and seeing some of the tumultuous points in their lives, um, you know, it's, I thought it'd be really great for them to hear the stories of other leaders uh, through thick and thin, whatever it was that they had to go through, uh, at their comfort level, obviously some people have shared more than others, but it's entirely up to them. And so I've had a roster of wonderful guests and today is absolutely no exception. So, uh, you're not again here for me. I always say you're here for my guests. I'm just going to introduce you to my guest today. And, uh, his name is Anthony Veal. He's the CEO, uh, chief executive officer of Canada and Chile Deloitte. So, he became Chief Executive Officer of Deloitte Canada and Chile in June 2019. His vision for the firm reflects a commitment to pursue bold and focused growth choices to make a stronger Canada and Chile for our clients and com communities. Guided by the firm's shared values and category of one aspiration, AV, which is his name for short, strongly believes that serving clients with distinction goes hand in hand with promoting an inclusive workplace that prioritizes wellness and elevates everyone to reach their full potential. Anthony joined Deloitte in 2000 in Australia, and since then he has made a significant impact on the firm, holding a number of leadership roles in forensics and financial advisory and analytics in Australia. Most recently, he was a managing partner of financial advisory services and uh, analytics. He lives in Toronto with his wife and four children and is known within the firm simply as AV. So without further ado, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Simeon. It's great to be here. And thank you so much for, for joining me. I know you're extremely busy, as I would expect any CEO, uh, especially of a large organization like Deloitte. But thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, I know there's going to be a bit of a lag. Sometimes it's for my connection here, but the audience can hear you. So no problems about the, the audio there. Anthony, so I, I didn't know you. So I, I joined Deloitte back in 2003, straight out of business school. And uh, that was, I, I was joking with Graham uh, earlier, your, uh, your uh, part of your CEO team, that um, there was no, inter I felt like there was no internet back in 2003 because you, you couldn't do market research the same way that you can do now, per se. But at the same time, I personally feel that there is a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot less kind of, opinionated kind of fluff that was out there. So what you did get was quite quality. Whenever people published something, it was great. And I remember back in Deloitte days that we we did a lot of work at Deloitte around thought leadership. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really enjoyed starting my career there. So I'm thrilled that you're able to join the show. It's kind of coming full circle to me. I've never thought that I would talk to the CEO of, uh, of Deloitte Canada and Chile. So thank you so much. Um, so the purpose of this series is to hear about people's personal journeys and career journeys. Mm -hmm. And so I guess for those of you who don't know, uh, don't know you or what it is that a, a CEO does of a large consulting advisory uh, uh, company, maybe you can kind of just walk us through a little bit if there is a typical day in the life of, which I know there is not, but tell us what you do. Uh, well, as you said, um, I've got the privileged position for, uh, for a few years as CEO of uh, Deloitte Canada. There's 16,000 of us uh, across two countries, Canada and Chile. Uh, right. So it's a big team. <laughs> we serve yeah. thousands, tens of thousands of clients uh, across all areas of professional services. And some of you may think Deloitte, you think audit and tax. We've got great teams there, um, but we've also got bigger and uh, teams across the whole gamut of professional services. Hence, um, why, uh, you know, I am a CEO and I'm not an accountant, for instance, uh, and you can tell from my accent <laughs> and from the introduction, I'm not a Canadian. So in 165 right. years of our history, uh, I'm the first non-accountant, non-Canadian that's been given this privilege. 
right? Yeah. And uh, it just reflects that the expanse of our offerings is much, much wider than what they were even as, as, as recently as 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and certainly, as I have known uh, a lot of my colleagues from back then, and we all kind of grown up since then together, um, the, the expanse of where Deloitte is reaching now as far as projects go and offerings go is tremendously bigger than 20 years ago, right? So sure. and that's very, very exciting to see. Um, I was uh, telling Graham again earlier today that since I left Deloitte, I did go and join two other firms uh, as in consulting. And uh, without naming names, and people can look at my LinkedIn profile, but I mean, I, I say that the culture at Deloitte is probably the best that I've ever experienced out of all my career uh, places. And uh, I'm just wondering, from your perspective, why, why do you think the culture at Deloitte is so special? I think, well, to be honest, it's it's special for me. It was special for you, Simeon. Uh, it's, uh, it's very much what I describe a we are together culture. Um, I contrast that with a me, my, I culture. And mm. that's something that, you know, you can't do overnight. I mean, you think about our background, we came with, you know, each partner had their own piece of a cooperative, if you will. Right. Uh, but now as we're getting larger, we're having to operate more as, you know, coordinated across uh, our businesses, uh, which is right. which is up to Simeon 29 different businesses. So. Wow. How do you string together those 29 different businesses? You can't do it all alone. Right. And we can't deliver the experiences for our people and our clients unless you bring the best of those 29 businesses to you know, business challenges and opportunities. Right, yeah, absolutely. And the diversity is incredible. I really love the introduction where you talk about wellness and diversity inclusion. And uh, those words are so much thrown around these days, but very few companies can actually execute on that. And I remember even back then when I was a consultant uh, at Deloitte that there was an emphasis already there about wellness. So, okay, so career journeys. Um, I would love to hear, and the audience would love to hear about how, you know, how you got to the point where you are today, right? So um, in, if it helps you to think about milestones, if it helps you to think about um, inspirational people in your life, you know, how did you get to where you are today and make decisions that you made in your career? I'd love to hear about that. I normally answer that question, Simeon, with luck um, uh, because we do need a little bit of luck. And the luck is in the context of not working hard, um, not you know keeping your mind open to opportunities, but luck is about, to me, is about running into um, and, uh, sometimes coincidentally some of the best coaches and mentors and sponsors, um, which you'll hear mm. I talk about a lot. And, you know, I've just been fortunate enough to find a lot of sponsors uh, on my journey. Uh, and it's a long journey. Uh, I was, I'm first generation Australian, born to Italian immigrants, okay. and first one to go to university. Uh, I ended up uh, taking four degrees, um, undergraduate and postgraduate, uh, over a span of uh, 18 years, <laughs> which my wow. wife did. My, my wife still doesn't talk about um, uh, full and part time. Uh, so I was very much, you know, I, I, I didn't even know who Deloitte was when I joined them, to be honest with you, um, okay. back in 2000. That's the type of background I come up through. Um, and uh, and when I, my, I originally, my first start was with a regulator, the companies and securities regulator in Australia. They administer the securities law and the companies law. And I remember, this is a bit of luck too, perhaps, I remember that there was an unsolvable financial crime and uh, somebody taught me how to program. So I built a program or an algorithm to identify um, uh, the, the, the folk behind the financial crime. And that started my career in analytics. That's where analytics was born for me. That was a huge milestone for me. And it's also where I met my sponsor and now dear friend, uh, mm. all, all that time back then, uh, uh, he left the organization. I left the organization to different organizations. And then he started the Deloitte forensic practice in Australia. And I was his third recruit and I wow. didn't know about Deloitte. I didn't know too much about forensic outside companies law. And right. I just, I went for him, you know, because I really saw the value in right. the mentorship and the sponsorship and, uh, as I say, the rest is history. He, you know, he graduated me from forensic to analytics, 
analytics at the firm level in Australia, then analytics globally. That put me on the map with Canada, and that's how I come to Canada. Uh, so I just wow. I share that. There was that's hopefully give them context of the luck comment that I made earlier. Yeah, for sure. And when you were when you were growing up, then um, were there people in your life that you know? Some people have said high school teachers, right, have really made an impact on them as far as deciding what route to go through. Some people have said university professors or, or friends who have been. Was there anybody in your life that kind of really made an impression before you even made some career decisions? I indeed I remember my sixth grade teacher in Australia. That's when you go to high school. Uh, okay. I think he actually, in his exit speech to us, I, I may have had a tear in my eye. And, uh, it was so personal to me, the impact that he had on me and, and keeping me, I guess, um, you know, on the right side of, you know, compassion and empathy and thinking of others and that sort of stuff. So that 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 was a long time ago, I can assure you. Uh, but I still sure. remember I still remember him. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I grew up to migrant parents, hard workers. We started on a banana farm. <laughs> we finished in a green grocer store. Wow. And my next door neighbor was a school teacher. And, uh, he was okay. instrumental. He also happened to be the father of my best friend. But again, he was the first, uh, I will say, person in my life that had a degree who went to university. Uh, and okay. he was fundamental um, in, in opening up the you know, the aperture to possibilities, because it was very traditional in my family to follow what your father did. And, uh, right. uh, and, and so that was, that was very pivotal for me that it, that got me to university or at least planted the seed to go to university. And, um, uh, that, that, that were two pivotal gentlemen that uh, were important in my, uh, career choices, if you will. Gotcha. And did you ever struggle with sort of majoring in any Part of particular study like yeah. was it always going to be business or was it also science or something like that or did you have to make those decisions uh, it was it was it was totally uh random that i got into actuarial studies uh okay. i was good at i was good at math i'm in a small country town the careers advisor basically said the highest paid math degree in 1986 is actuarial studies how do you feel about that anthony is that what they called me in those days? And and that was about as much careers advice as I got. You were saying this is before the internet. So getting your mm -hmm. own research uh, was, was tough to do, particularly in an obscure field like actuarial studies. Um, gotcha. And that's probably explains why I studied full and part time because I love learning. Mm -hmm. um, I did actuarial studies, then I did law, undergraduate, postgraduate law, and then I did applied finance. Okay, and, and I felt that I was just getting better as a learner as well. So it was less and less challenging, I guess. And I got better. And maybe there was a lesson in there as well about, you know, choosing, listening better and, and really choosing the points of impact as I learn. So um, right. that's a long answer to say, Simeon, that I, I don't know no. many 19 year old boys that really know what they want to do with their life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thankfully there wasn't uh, the PlayStation or yes. you know too many video games that really right now kind of dilute that choice, right? Because you really kind of focus on you know looking forward and kind of thinking about what's what you, what are you gonna do the next day? Like the literal, the creativity of your juices come into play, and and I think sometimes that is probably what propels a lot of the executives that I've worked with when they were younger to kind of be curious, right, about the way that the world works as opposed to kind of you know, the age of digital. So, um, so when you were going through, so you said you, you did a law degree and what compelled you to do law? Like what was, what was about that? That was so special. And you're saying, you say, I, like, I said, well. I, went to, I went, I went to the regulator, Simeon, and, uh, like most regulators around the world, they're, they're run by lawyers and there's nothing wrong with that, but I wasn't mm -hmm. a lawyer. And uh, I, I remember that when we're doing insider trading cases or we're doing what we call front running uh, a market or short selling, uh, there's big investigations. And it was, it was very interesting that there was a fax that was very data driven, which I was great at. And then there was this sort of legal strategy, <laughs> which I didn't have a voice at the table. I was excluded, right. so to speak. So I like right. to tell people that I got my law degree out of spite. 
so I could have a voice at the table. <laughs> and uh, that was probably the genesis of it all. Did you ever practice as a lawyer then? No, no, uh, but applied the skills you would appreciate in some of the big investigations that you would get involved in, of given evidence, of prepared briefs uh, uh, for particular cases and the like. But no, I've never, I've never had to do these uh, chargeable hours, if you will, as a lawyer. Gotcha. When you were kind of growing up through the ranks then, so now you went from law to kind of at that point, you're buckling down a little bit more on business career mm -hmm. and financial advice services and forensics uh, or analytics at the end of the day. Um, the lessons that kind of brought you to where you are today as a CEO, tell me about some of the things that you learned as you're going through the ranks that have prepared you for this kind of a leadership. It's, it's a huge responsibility, high visibility, lots of demands and, like, what have you picked up along the way that are that things that are very important for you now as, as a leader? So as a leader, I think it, it's incumbent to get as much reliable information, data, if you will, about particular situations. And that got burned into me um, through my analytics career because I was witnessing as an advisor, um, as an employee, that some decisions were not being made on the data that was available to particular leaders. And it sort of become a point of passion, if you will, that I wanted to be as data-driven, evidence-based, decision-making leader as I could. Um, right. Which, you know, my saying is, is there data? If there's not, we make a, our best guess, but I also make a commitment to capture data. So mm. what, uh, as a strategist, uh, you'd appreciate this, Simeon, uh, the, you know, I'm a, a sort of guided missile uh, uh, or a proponent of the guided missile approach to strategy, yeah. um, which is effectively shoot it in the direction and use data in flight to tune um, the missile in flight so that you hit the target. I don't know if you know the statistics, but uh, a, a guided missile is off target nearly all of its journey, yet it hits its target like 99% of the time. So, wow. okay. I, so so where there's no data, I commit to go and get it. And I, and right. I, and I shape in flight, if you will. Um, uh, and sometimes you need to backtrack based on what the data is telling you. That's a very interesting insight and uh, analogy because it really t speaks to uh, when I'm, so now I'm an executive coach. So I work with a lot of uh, global executives who are saying that, you know, they started off their journey and their career really excited, kind of learning what they wanted to learn and thinking that they were on the right trajectory, right? But somehow along the way, things have got a little bit bumpy and um, it could be their their particular area of discipline or could be them personally, right? Has sort of changed. And one of the things that we always talk about as consultants, like with our clients is what is your goal, right? Where, where do you want to land? I think that's a great analogy that I think I'll use from now, which is even from an individual career perspective, the question is, where do you see yourself leaving behind as far as legacy, right? Um, as far as something that is impactful, that does that's a, that sort of shifted and moved, I guess, humanity one step further. Yeah. And yeah. I guess the assurance that if you set that goal correctly, that in the middle of the flux, it is going to be up and down. Uh, I really, really like that. That's a, that's a great analogy. That's great. Uh, I'll use it. Yes, Simeon, if I may, it's a... Uh, uh, Folk will come to me as a patent or as a coach, not quite sure which of the which of the two, maybe even a sponsor sometimes. They'll say, What will I do for the next five years? What what is my next role in the next five years? And and, and it's a similar question that I have for my children who are early twenties. And, and mm -hmm. I'm sort of saying, I can't tell you exactly what's going you know, I can push you in a direction. I can give you some insights on the skills that I think are going to be successful. Mm -hmm. But it really, if I look back at my own career in the five-year increments backwards, I took a path that I couldn't see and I couldn't speculate way back then, if you know what I mean. Like it, yeah, just the, yeah, the world opens up uh, and the opportunities open up if you keep your mind open. You, you want to be sure that you've got that kit bag full of skills uh, and experiences when those opportunities come. But yeah. trying to get a, a real handle on what they are and when they're going to land and what they look like, I think it's yeah. very, very difficult these days. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, part of it, I think, is that there are a lot of options as well. There's a lot of different yes. 
nuances around, you know, it used to be really that you were an accountant or a lawyer if you're a consultant. That, uh, but there's so many, you know, I think, you know, you're talking about all the offerings that Deloitte has now. But within each one of them, there are subsets of specialties that you can become now that that you can't even put on paper. They don't exist yet, maybe until next yeah. year. And so as you as you keep your eyes and your ears open to different possibilities, sometimes the best thing is that you create your own niche. You create your own kind of you know category of uh, expertise and specialty. Um, do you see that kind of creativity right now in 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 LinkedIn? as a litmus test, you know, as a data person, it's not going to be very scientific. Okay. But the, the, the type of publications that come out, the things that come out, sometimes they kind of lack that creativity that once seemed to be there. Do you, do you see that happening kind of more? So how do you, how do you encourage creativity? Right? Well, we're, we're fortunate in professional services that the market almost compels us to come up with, right. something, come up with something new. Um, right. And, right sure. and it's almost like, Simeon, the longer you stay in a particular um, business or offering set, um, it's inevitable that if it's valuable, uh, our clients will build their own capability to do that, which means that you're effectively out of a job at a certain point in time in the future. Right. So that's always ticking along in the background. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the sort of the spark or the genesis, uh, but then the creativity has got to come in because as and when our clients and, and our alliance partners master something, it's it's up to you now to sort of say, what else do they need? What right. does it look like? What are the skills that you need to to deliver on that? And I love that about my job. That's the best part of my, my job is, you know, having a look at that white space and there's going to be more of it to your point that options and really, really crafting your own way toward, you know, what that opportunity is and what that career means for you in the future. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely love that. I think one of the questions that uh, folks and someone drilling upstairs, I apologize, but um, the question is around like, what kind of skills do I need to uh, equip myself for the next kind of generation, right? Especially if you're in transition, you're an executive, you've been working for 25, 30 years and you're really good at something is, there's almost a panic that says, I don't exactly know what to do to shift and to become relevant still again. But, you know, it's it's almost like the creativity has to always be there, even in the background as you're growing up, almost anticipating that one day you're going to have to transform into something different, right? Indeed. That's great. Um, I couldn't recommend that. I mean, uh, you know, acknowledging that, that you're going to have to reskill um, and being comfortable in the uncomfortable that you're going to have to reskill. Uh, I think is the first step of what what will be difficult. And uh, we at Deloitte see it as a real opportunity. You mentioned it in the introduction. You know, this is how you rebuild the countries. This is how you tackle the climate crisis. This is how you make Canada a leading nation um, in particular sectors uh, is, you know, reinventing yourself, reskilling yourselves and vectoring to where the future lies. And um, uh, that, that to me brings the most purpose to my current role is just trying to get, you know, not only Deloitte and Deloitte clients, but the communities and countries going in the right direction. Right. Anthony, let me just pull it back a little bit to your personal story again. Um, and I, I love this the kind of infusion of both. Um, speaking of kind of the journey experience and the ups and downs, the valleys and the highs, would you be able to share maybe one or two instances where you were actually having to go through some struggles, right? And maybe not significant ones, but ones that really had to make you think around uh, maybe, uh, you know, reinvigorating a part of you that had not been there or kind of making different decisions. And, and I guess second part of it is what, do you do that keeps you motivated? Like when you're in the down and out, the days that are not good, the seasons that are good, what kind of tips do you have for someone who is going through that kind of a, a wrestling right now? So um, if there's, there's, a, there's a couple of questions there and I hope I'll do them all for justice, but I guess, you know, my first challenge, I guess, was, you know, getting in the door to start with, um, you know, I didn't know where to start, quite frankly. I think when I left my university for the first time, 
I might have got up to 50 rejection letters, you know, or somewhere of that of that ilk. Uh, so when when I finally did get in the door, I, I found early in my career is very conservative. You know, take the path that's there in front of you, and and um, didn't take me long to get off that path. But that you know, it's just it's funny how you're conditioned, and recognizing that that's how you're conditioned. Um, uh, that was that was the first thing that I would say. The second thing is I've learned through my career also that what really energizes you, um, uh, what, is, what tasks, what outcomes, um, inevitably has a, a link to success, achievement, mm. uh, and right. the like. Uh, so that's a big takeaway. And coming back to data, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been trying right. and I study a lot of models to help understand what really right. energizes me? Because I think success equals, um, you know, is achievement at the end of the day. When you're happy, when you're balanced, when you feel like you have a bit of purpose, if you will. In right. terms of like challenges, uh, I wouldn't be the first person on this call that has found their career slowing a little bit. I mean, you know, when you first enter, you seem to be promoted every five minutes, and then and then those things right. stop. And then your next move sideways, yeah, <laughs> uh, sure. rather than rather than uh, rather than up, and then then you start getting interesting titles, and you're going, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't sound right, um, and you know that they can be daunting uh, as well, but they can also be gifts because they can be the trigger. You say motivate, it could mm -hmm. could snap you into uh, uh, you know some of the creativity that we're talking about earlier. You know some of right. the curry. And, and some of the option um, uh, uh, options that you're closing yourself out of when you are very comfortable, uh, and that right. happened in my career uh, for sure. Uh, and you know, one one of the things that I got told when I was, you know, accelerating through my career, I had a I had a corporate psychologist that sort of took a again could have been a mentoring role, could have been a sponsor role. He pulled me aside one day and he shared a proverb with me, an African proverb. And you've probably heard this before. He goes, you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that was a real pivot in my sort of career because I I was going to outwork everybody. I was going to, you know, mm -hmm. I was going to put in the, you know, the unnecessary effort, if you will, to make things just that 1% better uh, but he's, uh, you know, his message to me was, don't leave everyone behind. <laughs> They're actually your biggest asset, uh, and right. and they can help. And I learned that, and my career just went, uh, took off, uh, recognizing the power of teams, recognizing um, the diversity of teams, diversity right. of thinking, and, and the like. So, hopefully, it gives you a bit of a flavor to the questions that you, that you asked. But there's a, there's yeah. a couple of instances for you. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a few kind of quotes that you've already had so far that I, I would love to adopt. I've, I never thought about that. But um, I want to go back to one point you made about the lateral moves and how kind of things slow down, right? And I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And um, it, it's it's almost inevitable because it's like the triangle, right? At the bottom, there's a lot of, a lot of talent a lot of opportunities that you can have to, and you kind of progress based on how hard you work right that's just inevitable mm -hmm. but then as you get closer to the top right what happens to all these people that were there it doesn't go vertically upwards it gets shorter right so the lateral movements were they were they discouraging to you and 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 if not that's great but they are discouraging to a lot of people they they sure. i just got a call this morning that's with a lady that says um she loves her company and she loves what she's done, but she feels like she's no longer valued or heard. And uh, and what she's been given, like you said, doesn't really quite make sense. It's almost like they want to keep her around, but they don't really know what to call her. So those kinds of movements were they discouraging at all, or how did you how did you process those? Oh, for sure, for sure, and um, uh, discouraging uh, for sure, and probably you pro probably turns. Um, in on yourself to start sort of saying, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> what did mm -hmm. I miss? And you start getting down on yourself as well. Uh, discouraged um, is in the, you, like you said, and in, sometimes you got to, if you don't stop it, you'll get pretty bitter. Right. Right. Yeah. And you, 
you won't be enjoyable to be around, which which hurts me a <laughs> big. I don't want to be that person that no one wants to be around either, you know. So, uh, right. It's uh, it. You know what what I learned from that, I guess, is you know, it does give you an opportunity to reset and step back, right. and it, it clears away a lot of um, perhaps the other distraction that was in your life before you got mm-hmm. the sideways move. To right, see right. things will maybe a bit clearer, um, and as I said, it can act as a bit of a catalyst for you, or a, a you know a spark to get you going again, um, right. in a in a in a different direction. Uh, yeah, I think it, yeah. I think it also provides you an opportunity to. You would have heard this term before: grit or perseverance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it gives you a it gives you an opportunity to demonstrate that when things are tough. Uh, you know, when you when you maybe you're out of the spotlight a little bit, and you still grind it out, deliver impact and value, or depending on what uh, role you're in. Right. It sort of puts a bit of a like an acknowledgement out there to sure. leaders and, and and peers and colleagues to sort of say, this person's got grit. And yeah. When I, yeah. When I, and when I think of success, I put passion and grit equal so right. if you find right. what you're passionate about where your where your personal purpose is and you mm-hmm. add a grit that's a powerful combination and yeah i, I yeah. think that when you get adversity <laughs> you can you can demonstrate your grit and that's the way yeah. i look at the sideways move yeah there there's so much uh truth to that in i know in my own life i gave a ted talk uh in 2020 which is actually called uh letting failure drive you towards your passion career and for my slant was my slant was failure right and so you whatever people could call it different things but it was 20 years of reflection around all of my roles that i've had the couple of layoffs that i've been through and thinking about at each step of the way what was it that was important to me and keeping those things in sharp focus and being gritty about those things right and not being hard on yourself about the things that didn't work out unless you really cared about them. And if you did, the grit would, you know, pull you through it. You might take courses, you might try to get mentorship. Um, but you, you hit on so many things that passion and grit put together is so important. And, um, we sort of live a bit of an, in a society where grit is lost, where it's, it's far easier to kind of run away from things. And, um, and I just, I love for people to hear that from you and is that that's part of the, you know, things, some things never change in life, right? It's the mm-hmm. hardest working, but also people who are most perseverant, right? Most they persevere the hardest, right? They get far um, and can make a difference. So that's great. You, you just gave me a mental pause to think about what you're saying, which is awesome. Um, okay, so lateral moves, great. So when you went through that, the grit that you sh- were showing, I think in some sense, like your, to your point, show people around you that, hey, maybe this person should get higher up because that's the kind of leader that exactly. we need right exactly um exactly. And that so person's going to be person's going to be there in the bad as well as the good in the hard right. as well as the easy um in some respects it's easy to show when you're being cast aside perhaps or pushed to the back than it is when you're in the, in the first position if you will so um, mm-hmm. I, I i i learned um through recent reading that uh you know when you see an adverse situation it's it's a situation that you can't change but you can change the perspective on the situation so maybe like you sort of said a layoff or a sideways move it is what it is but change your perspective on it is this your catalyst to go and do what you quite frankly wanted to do in the first place but just couldn't get there because you're in a comfortable position yeah you know we hear a lot in in throughout our, our career that um you know when you encounter a wall you've got to think of ways to break through it and if you don't break through it you fail again again and again and but the reality is that there's a lot of things that we can't do even if we put our minds fully against it it's just not the way we're built right yes. and so the message that i was trying to show was that sometimes it's okay to go around the wall you know and not get through that and the way that you go around it is by just exploring, like being uh, not down yourself, but looking around and seeing what is it that you're good at and finding a career 
that will help you propel and, and deepen in those things, right? And then you'll, if you find that, then you'll be really good at that because that's exceptionally how you're built. So um, that's great. Okay, uh, so let me get back to script here. So I was asking about struggles, right? Uh, and so using that as an opportunity to see, uh, find ways to be perse uh, perseverant. As a mentor, we talk a lot about on this show about um, there's a common theme. You know, people are saying always leaders that I have on the show that um, finding a mentor is so important to developing your career. When you are mentoring now, right, as, as sort of being in the role that you are, what are some qualities of a mentor today that are needed, right? From everybody, my philosophy has always been that everyone should be a mentor of someone else. It should be someone, whether it's a peer mentor or someone that's, what are a couple of qualities that you think are important for mentors to demonstrate or show or teach? So uh, it's interesting. You said mentor, I said sponsor earlier mm -hmm. as well. I find some of the, the chat now, um, I'm probably looking to sponsor it more so than or some of the opportunities. I'm probably looking to sponsor more than mentor, but to your specific okay. question, and I can talk a little bit about that if, if, if you're interested, but the, the mentor um, or a sponsor, uh, I think it's important that you walk the talk, <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. Like uh, if you, um, as a mentor, as a leader even, uh, I've learned that you, and I tell this to all my leaders uh, as well, some of which I'm sure they, they see me as a mentor, is that you cast a big shadow. So it doesn't really matter what you say, it's what you do that mm -hmm. people will be inspired by or not. Right, right. <laughs> people will be, you know, um, uh, comfortable, safe or not. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's important as a mentor that you walk the talk. So the very right. advice um, that you're giving, it'd be nice to have a track record to say, I've done this before. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually an interesting, if you're interested, Simeon, um, Ray Dalio says it great uh, uh, from Bridgewater Investment uh, fame. Uh, he sort of says that believable people are people that have done it more, at least once. And the more time that they've done it, they're very believable. And he mm -hmm. used it in a different context, but I think that's important mm -hmm. from a mentor. If you've done what the if you've done what the advice you're giving, um, I think that takes you, gives your mentee just that extra layer of right. um, you know belief in themselves. Uh, I believe. Um, right. And uh, uh, so that that would be my comment about that. You mentioned earlier about a sponsor versus a mentor. What's the difference between the two? I don't know if this is a popular definition, but I'm glad you asked it. Uh, I'm going to come back to your wall that you just described okay. and, and crashing through that wall. Okay. I think a mentor is great to help you with, with tactics and strategies to break through the wall or go around the wall, when you should go around, when you should break through. Okay. And, that, and mentors play a massive role in that regard. I think the sponsors <laughs> are the one who actually breaks the wall down for you. Or, right, and then right. that opens it up, uh, gets to the other side, and then you know gets into that opportunity right. um, that you so you so deserve. So for me, that sponsor is they're getting their hands dirty. You know, mm -hmm. they're, yeah, they're, they're speaking on your behalf when nobody's watching. Uh, you know, right. they're, they're 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 taking their brand out um, uh, and putting their brand on the line, their reputation to bring you through to whatever it is, you know, next level, yeah. motion, opportunity, uh, mm -hmm. ex introduction, et cetera. That, that's gotcha. the difference between the two. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One's a bit more practical and closer to where I come from, <laughs> getting my hands dirty. One's a yeah. little bit more intellectual, I guess. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think I've, I've heard another term similar to sponsors advocate, right? Yeah. Someone who will advocate on your behalf, uh, even when you're not there and uh, sort of act as your, the eyes and ears and also information to tell people about, you know, this person is actually very trustworthy and, uh, you know, we should take a chance on him, right? I have to tell you though, like in my years in corporate, there aren't that many people who are, who are putting themselves out there. 
you know, and, and, and being able to do that for various reasons. Right. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of just not knowing how to do that. Um, but my personal plug is that if you open your eyes and see what is around you, that there's a lot of people who need you to be there for them. Right. Not just as a mentor, a sponsor, but even someone who's just, um, a compadre, right. Someone who goes through the ranks together. And so that's part of the reason why I want people to hear your story is because of the fact that we're not alone, right? We're not alone in any of this. And there's always similarities with their story with yours as well. So, okay. Um, I will leave one more question for you. Serious question about one final tip, right? That you would say, here's an important quality, um, coming up in the future for a leader to have. So you've talked about, you know, walking, the walking, the talk, uh, you talk about being a sponsor, being a mentor, um, you talk about being gritty right in the, in the face of, uh, of adversity. Uh, would there be anything else that you you've left out that you want to sort of you know broadcast out there as a motivational quote? Uh, I was going to. I don't, I'm not sure if it's a motivational quote, but let me give you a uh, let me give you a sense of a quality that's out there. I think the quality for um, uh, you know human to human interaction to augment you know the um, you know the digital um, augmentation. Um, uh whether that's you know uh, virtual reality or augmented reality or what have you i think that's still going to be extremely important i wonder if we still got that skill um mm -hmm. if we're still okay. developing that skill and what i mean by that is maybe in a very simple example is that you know, i was taught um took me a while to work this one out but i was taught early on you got two ears and one mouth and you should use them in the, that um in that sort of ratio if you will right. so listen right. twice talk once and i worry that we're not listening enough to each other and you know this is probably a little bit broader than what you're thinking about but mm -hmm. if we have a look at some of the societal that we're facing today some of the inability to get behind the you know world ending challenges that we're facing today i think right. we're not listening <laughs> there's a lot of people talking we're just not listening right. i think that quality is not only important for our planet potentially um it's going to be important on your leadership journey um your ability right. to listen your ability to take in perspective your ability to come up with the right solutions to the biggest problems facing your organization your career mm -hmm. you know, countries uh or the planet and uh that that to me is an oldie <laughs> but i think it's a goodie from a quality perspective yeah yeah, I would add one more thing to that is I've I've recently started to say you also have one nose, and the nose is an is a is a is an organ that's used to sniff nuances, um, and I think that's so critical as well that that's the emotional quotient element of things where there's <laughs> listening and talking, but there's also the what do they actually mean, right? Like what's the sniff test around like you know, so uh, I'm gonna borrow that one off you, Simeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not. I haven't trademarked it yet, so let's let, just wait for, for for me to do that. So, um, Anthony, thank you so much for your time. I have a few rapid fire questions that I always love to end up with. They're very predictable, so if you haven't heard them, this is the first time, but they're not surprising. Okay, so number one is, uh, what is your alter ego profession? If you weren't the CEO of Canada and Chile, Deloitte, what would you be? Probably be a sign. Um, trying to, I would have liked to go and gone after like developing the vaccine that would have really got me going if you will okay. so probably something something in that field research and science uh, and scientific gotcha what is the name of uh, a book or a movie title that would best describe you or your career It'll betray a little bit about your hobbies and kind of what you like to watch or read. Yeah, well, I, I watch a lot of mindless uh, Marvel movies and that sort of stuff. I okay. always say to my wife, something I don't have to think too much about is where I go these days. But uh, sure. And I'm thinking of those movie titles. I'm not quite sure. Uh, what about what about what about a superpower then? If you love Marvel, what what, what would that be? Yours? A superpower? Yeah, I, I always thought it'd be pretty cool to fly. <laughs> okay. Yep. 
yeah and 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 you fluctuate but you end up at the same target at the right target right exactly right fly. exactly right good one anthony what's uh what's one word that you love One word that you love. Courage? Yes. And why is that? Why is courage the one that you picked? I think that it's something that you've got to keep even more so in today's day and age. It's We're talking about careers. You need courage in your careers every day. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, that, that all the time. You're making decisions at, at work, making decisions at home. Um, it's not always it's not always easy to do that, and you encourage it. It's, called, it's probably the virtue that's called on more mm -hmm. than ever. For sure, encouraged to make decisions and hopefully the right decisions, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, or courage to make a decision, Simeon. Sometimes they're not going to be right. Mm -hmm. the, the courage to step back and make the next decision. Well, sometimes. Yeah, the courage to take responsibility for the consequences of those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, what's one word that you hate? Unprecedented. <laughs> okay. We we heard like it, we've heard it too often. It's got a bad name in the last two years. Um, so uh, I okay. can explain a bit more about that. But, uh, you know, okay. we, we've overused it. Things that have happened to us in the last two years it was really predictable at the end of the day <laughs> it ha has happened it had happened in various shapes and forms in history we just forgot about it you know right right there's nothing new under the sun as they say right yeah exactly last question for you uh what's one covid uh hobby or habit that you've developed uh i've i've, I've read um stoicism uh philosophy uh Okay. I've never done that with all my reading that I've done in my academic career. I've never read philosophy and I'm starting to read a lot of that. Do you have a favorite author or a favorite philosopher? Uh, Holiday. Um, he, he speaks a lot about the Stoics. He's prolific. I recommend him to everybody. Mm -hmm. And in the context of today's discussion, he has a great book called Stillness is the Key which I've read three times in the last 18 months. So I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Gotcha. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much, Anthony. Really appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully people who have not heard the personal side of you uh, now have learned something more about your alter ego profession and the word unprecedented, and they'll never use that around you ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Simeon. It's an absolute pleasure. And I hope my comments can help somebody uh, on, on uh, that tunes in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend, and uh, I'll see you. I'll see you in the news and the media. I follow you as a as an avid first degree connection on LinkedIn. So, thank you so much. Stay, stay tuned. Take care. Thank you. Right. So another wonderful, uh, really, uh, I guess, awe inspiring, a lot of insightful interview just now, and. Um, you know, like I said, starting back in my career at Deloitte, there were so many fond memories that I had there. And um, a lot of it had to do with sponsorship and mentor. I have to say some of the first um, great examples in business where I never thought there would be kind people in business were actually demonstrated at Deloitte. Um, so I guess a plug for the firm. But, uh, you know, hopefully you took uh, uh, some sage advice from uh, from Anthony and um you know, feel free to reach out to him with a comment or a question or something like that on LinkedIn um, or to me, you know, and I can sort of convey that over. And uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, until next week, uh, next week, I've got actually got a professor of mine from McMaster who he was uh, very critical in my formative years as well. And I would say he was a bit of a sponsor to me. So stay tuned, uh, stay safe, guys, and have a great weekend.